Welcome, everyone. My name is Gail Ermer, and I am currently serving as chair of Calvin's engineering department. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here today for this seminar and book launch. Um, students especially, you are welcome. And those of you who are here for seminar credit, the engineers know it's a salmon colored sheet. And the computer science students know it's a orange card, right? All right, and welcome also to um, other guests, faculty and staff from across the university, and those of you from off campus. We're so glad that you can be here to celebrate with us today. So um, I am honored and grateful to be um, introducing our speakers today. I am um, glad to call them colleagues and also friends, and because I've been peripherally involved with this project for many years, I thought I would just fill in, uh, to the extent that I can, a little bit of the history and some of the relationships and personalities that have impacted this. So um, those of you who are engineering faculty here will certainly recognize the book cover that's on the left. Responsible technology has been a key resource for all of us over many years when reflecting carefully on the relationship between faith and technology. It's um, wonderfully principled and it's in depth, but it was published back in 1986, which yeah, is the same year that I graduated from Calvin, and of course it's quite a few years before any of you students were even born. So you can imagine that although there are great foundational principles here, it's gotten harder and harder over the years to um, introduce them to students in a way that's accessible and to think about how they might apply to all the changes that have happened in technology development over the last few years. So we've been thinking about this for quite a while. Um, various folks have worked on thinking about what it would look like to either update this book, have a volume two, or write something that was targeted at a little bit different audience. And uh, the other picture that's up here is of a colleague from Dort University, Dr. Charles Adams, and one of the early efforts goes back to the um, summer of 2005, I believe it was, when Steve and Charlie and I got together um, under the funding of a CCCS grant to start talking about what this project might look like and what it would involve. Unfortunately, within three years of that meeting, Charlie was in a bad car accident and he was unable to participate. And actually, he passed away in 2017. He was a wonderful and wise mentor to us. We really miss him. And I'm sort of happy to connect him with this presentation because I know Steve and Derek would say they owe a lot to him as well. And it's wonderful to see his legacy continued here. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of some history and personalities. I'll let Derek and Steve fill in more of the details. Uh, but I also wanted to use this opportunity to plug a couple of organizations that are maybe peripherally uh, intersecting with this work as well. The Christian Engineering Society is a group of Christian engineers um, founded in 2016 by Steve Vanderleest. And we have a conference coming up this summer in, from June 29 to July 1 in Minneapolis at the University of Northwestern. So if you are intrigued by these ideas and want to continue the conversation, please consider coming to that particular conference. Students, there are also scholarships available. It's not a super high expensive experience. I encourage you all to get involved if you can. And then the American Scientific Affiliation is an organization that has been around for a long, long time to um, examine the interaction between Christian faith and all STEM disciplines. And Derek is a fellow of that organization and has been involved with them, as have I over the years. So I would again encourage you to look up their information if you want to keep thinking about these things. And then finally, um, we have a proposal out there for a Calvin Center for the Study of Faith and Technology. It's not funded yet. If any of you have some extra cash, we would be open to those kinds of donations. Um, but I want to put it in front of you. We are looking for opportunities for Calvin to be a center of these kind of conversations. Since we have such qualified faculty and other folks involved in these disciplines, it would be great to have that happen here. So it is our tradition to not do de uh, highly developed introductions for our speakers. We like to let them tell their own stories about God, how God has led them to be here. 
Um, but I will just say for those of you that don't know, that Steve Vanderleest was a faculty member at Calvin for many years. He also served as a department chair. In um, about 2014, he started to transition out of academia into roles in uh, industry at the managerial and um, lead engineer level, and that's what he is currently pursuing now. Derek Sherman joined Calvin's faculty in 2017, I think, if I've got that right, uh, coming from teaching experiences at Redeemer University and Dork College. Before that, he spent a lot of years in industry as well, designing embedded systems. So they are both qualified folks who are serious about their Christian faith and have a lot of experience dealing with today's technology. And I will now turn it over to Derek, welcoming both of them to speak on behalf of their new book. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, and yes, she was peripherally involved in this. I, we had hoped she would have been more directly involved because we asked her to write some chapters, but her administrative duties um, were, were a bit much and uh, she wasn't able to participate in the project, but we had hoped uh, that she would have been an author with us. Um, if you asked where this began, this whole story began, how this book began, I, I could actually go really far back. And uh, it, it, this is me as a teenager hunched over a ham radio project. I've always been delighted with technology uh, and working with, with tech. Uh, it was something that I delighted in at a very young age, playing with crystal radios and electronic projects for sometimes mischievous ends. Um, I was also there during the early computer revolution, the early personal computer revolution, and my very first computer, which I purchased with my paper root money, was a Timex Sinclair ZX81, equipped with one kilobyte of memory, membrane keyboard, and you, you know, saved and loaded your, your programs to an audio cassette tape, and you, your monitor was channel three on your television, your black and white television. <laughs> But this is how it started for me. I was completely delighted and smitten by this. Um, I had no clue where this technology would eventually lead us, as, as we see today. But I, I, I wanted to learn more. And it became a vocation, this hobby. I went on to study engineering in a large public university, a secular university. And when I graduated, I felt equipped to be able to solve any technical problem that would come my way. And I began working in a small high-tech startup in Waterloo, Ontario. Canada's Silicon Valley North and in the, in the business of designing uh, embedded systems. But my engineering education, as wonderful as it was, um, technically speaking, had left a bit of a gap. Um, I had not gone to a Christian college. I had not learned about how to connect my faith to my work as an engineer. And I remember clearly sitting in a cubicle farm asking the question, what does my faith have to do with my work as an engineer? Um, and this isn't a new question. Um, early on, the early church father once asked the question, Tertullian once asked, you know, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? How, what does culture have to do with our work? Uh, what, what does Silicon Valley have to do with Jerusalem? And so um, that was the beginning of a long process that continues to this day of me trying to understand my, my delight in the creational aspects of technology, but then also understanding what it means to be obedient in that area. And the last chapter, I'm going to read a small segment from the book. Um, the last chapter, chapter 10, is entitled Letters to a Young Engineer. And it's letters between a professor and a young, brand new graduate of a Christian college who is in an engineering profession. And truth be told, these letters reflect the older me and the younger me. Um, but uh, I thought I would share one of these letters which reflects some of the feelings I was feeling when I was a young engineer. So to Professor Van Weiss, <clears throat> dear Professor Van Weiss, how are things going? It's hard to believe it's been four years since graduation. As I shared in a previous letter, I moved to a town called Springfield on the West Coast where I started my first job as a junior engineer at the Acme Corporation. I really enjoyed my time studying engineering at a Christian college, but I'm finding that work in the real world can be challenging. I sit in a large beige cubicle farm as part of a team that designs a part for a small sub-assembly that's used in larger products. I report to a team lead who reports to our manager, who in turn reports to a senior manager, and so on. 
My team is responsible for a logic circuit that's used in a larger module implemented in a programmable logic chip, one of dozens in a circuit board, which is one of seven in a chassis, which is one of several used in aircraft avionics. Like the parts I help design, I feel like a small cog in a giant machine. Frankly, there are some days at work when I see my life reflected in the comic character, Dilbert. My supervisor's not pointy-haired, like the boss portrayed in the Dilbert comic, but he does share other traits. For instance, he does not seem to understand or appreciate the technical challenges our department faces. He often raises his voice in meetings, hovers critically over employees seated at their desks, imposes unreasonable project deadlines, and takes credit for the idea of others. My coworkers come from a variety of different backgrounds. Some are easy to work with, and others are somewhat eccentric. My cubicle mate, Larry, seems to be unaware of basic social norms. He periodically clips his toenails at his desk and frequently tells crude jokes. Things often get tense as deadlines loom and people start deflecting blame to others, leading to conflict. The tight deadlines are coupled with expectations to put in long hours, and I often come home late, making it difficult to be involved in other activities outside of work. In college, I was inspired by an exciting, comprehensive kingdom vision, but now, now that I'm in the real world, work often seems tedious, stressful, and at times inconsequential. Truth be told, I often wonder exactly how my faith really matters in a large corporate setting with little opportunity to make a real difference. Anyway, I wanted to send you my new email address and take a moment to reconnect. Best regards from your former student, Dan. And, and the letters continue, and you'll, you'll have to get the book somehow if you're gonna see how the professor responds and how these letters go back and forth. And the letters include you know, discussions of other things that come up along the way um, and, and different challenges that Dan faces in his new work. Truth be told, there's lots of book about, books about faith and technology, and just a few are pictured here. And these are prophetic books that talk about the philosophy and theology of technology. But many of these books are by philosophers and theologians who, quite frankly, don't always know the challenges faced by engineers. They, they often wring their hands with the, 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 the challenges that technology brings. If we were to use a creation, fall, redemption framework, a lot of these books focus on the fallenness of technology, the problems that we have with technology. And uh, early on when we started this book project, a, uh, a notable bookseller, Byron Borger from Hearts and Minds Books said to us, don't write another one of those books. You know, we don't need one of those books. What we need is a book that can be for designers, for people thinking about the creational possibilities, a practical guide for how, how, how this might look. And hence the, the title was sort of something we gravitated toward early on, a field guide to technology. We'll have to wait and see what people, um, <clears throat> if people find out whether or not we accomplish that in our book. Later on, after working in industry for a while, I became um, uh, called, a sense of call to, uh, to, to Christian University. And I began teaching at Redeemer University College in Ontario, Canada. And it was there that I began to develop as a Christian scholar. I basically got my liberal arts undergraduate education by working for a Christian college, and I delighted in learning more. And one of the people that I learned a lot from was uh, Al Walters, the author of Creation Regained, who was a colleague and a wise elder statesman at Redeemer. And it was in Creation Regained that I learned a lot of the basics about what it means to be a Christian scholar. And I'm grateful to him and others at Redeemer, people like Elaine Bota and David Koizis and Kevin Vandermeulen, lots of colleagues who were, um, who together we formed a community of Christian scholars who were asking these questions in our disciplines. Charlie Adams is another person who had a, a large impact on me. Um, I, uh, I read a lot of his works early on. Um, Al Walter's work, Creation Regained, was great for a general Christian worldview, but when thinking Christianly about technology, Charlie Adams had a really winsome and um, uh, eloquent way of, of, of describing this. His, his article, The Value-Ladenness of Technology in the Engineering Curriculum, was very helpful to me. Other writers, like Egbert Sherman, who's no relation to me, a uh, philosopher or engineer turned philosopher <clears throat> uh, have also been really, really helpful. Uh, and it turns out that I found out later on that my wife grew up in the same small Netherlands village, Dutch village, that uh, Egbert uh, lived in. And she went to school with Egbert Sherman's daughter. 
And uh, since then, we've had different conversations, and Egbert's been a great encourager. And of course, the book, Responsible Technology, I can, I can wave it to you here. It's sort of dog-eared, and it's got lots of post-it notes in it and so on, but that has been a really, really helpful book um, along the way in, in growing as a Christian scholar. Um, I'm really, really grateful for the insights of Reformed um, neo-Calvinist theologians, uh, all represented here. Um, I think they've been a, done a great service in trying to connect the dots between faith and learning uh, and um, have been wonderful voices in the larger CCCU community as well, as, uh, as Gail has mentioned. And also being part of a wider community of Christian scholars, I learned a lot by joining groups like the Christian Engineering Society, which, uh, which Steve was, was instrumental in, in forming. Um, also communities like the ASA, American Scientific Affiliation, and the ACMS, the Association of Christians in the Mathematical Sciences. All of these have been wonderful communities of Christian scholars who are working on the same project of thinking about what it means to be obedient in the areas where we've been called a place for iron sharpening iron. And this is where I first met the two co-authors, Ethan and Steve, was at Christian Engineering um, events. And if you squint and look in the back row, you'll see Steve and Ethan and I uh, there. And if you look over to the right a little bit, you'll see Gail as well peeking out uh, from near the back row as well. This is where we originally met at these conferences, and this is where the conversations began. At one point um, in my career uh, teaching at uh, Redeemer University College, I encountered some turmoil. Redeemer decided to close their computer science department, of which I was a faculty member at a time when they were experiencing some tremendous budget challenges, and I was left um, uh, yeah, discombobulated, to say the least. My wife and I went away to pray uh, about what we should do next, and uh, during that weekend, we discerned that perhaps God was calling us to go to some fledgling Christian college, perhaps in Africa or somewhere overseas, um, to help uh, teach uh, computer science or engineering. And while we were praying, our phone kept ringing, and we, uh, we ignored it because it had a 712 area code, which seemed um, far off. And uh, the, the next day, uh, we answered the phone, and uh, just on our way uh, after this time of prayer, um, we picked up the phone and it was Door College. And they said, can you come for a year? We'd like you to come for a year um, to act as a visiting professor. This felt like an answer to prayer. And so this is where we ended up going and we spent the 2015, 2016 year at Dort University, uh, then Dort College. What was interesting was that almost within a few weeks of arriving there, Dort said, we need a book. We need a book about faith and engineering. And again, they were using responsible technology too, this, this you know, four decades some old book that was a little bit tired and getting long in the tooth, even though it was a beautiful book that informed much of my own thinking. And students didn't find it that engaging to read. I kind of nodded at the folks at Dort and said, yeah, okay, maybe a book. But in my mind, I thought that's too much work. I don't think that's ever gonna happen. But Dort doubled down and they said, we'll give you money from the Andrea Center to help fund this. And with that money, we both Ethan and I, Ethan Brew, who is an engineering professor at Dort University, we decided to call Steve and invite him to come down to Dort and we began hammering out the original structure and chapters for the book that, uh, that is the one you see before you today. Um, during that time, I also had a moment to be able to go and visit Charlie Adams. I'd read so much of his work, but I'd never met him. Unfortunately, this was after his accident and he was you know, relegated to a wheelchair, barely able to communicate a shadow of the person whom I had read in all the different essays he had written over the years. And um, it was a reminder that we all contribute to this project for a season, and we pray that the Lord blesses the work of our hands. Um, a reminder too that one's life does not consist in the abundance of your publications, and uh, you know, to be faithful while, while we're called to do the work that we do, to keep the main thing the main thing. And I'm still convinced that, that a book like the one that we've, we've produced is, is, is necessary. I, I just came back from a trip to a, a Christian college south uh, of here, um, and, uh, and they were hung, hungry to learn about connecting faith and technology and uh, discovering frameworks for this. This is a publication, um, a journal article from the Journal of Christian Higher Education about predicting faculty integration of faith and learning. 
And uh, there's a little blow up of the abstract there, which says a second logistical regression model added faculty academic specialization as a predictor. Results in this study suggested that religion and philosophy instructors are the most likely to integrate faith into their teaching, and professors specializing in computer science, math, and engineering were the least likely. It's challenging. It's not trivial to connect the dots in computer science and engineering. But um, like I said, I'm grateful for a reformed Christian world and life view, which provides helpful, helpful tools for understanding this. Um, and I, I often say this to my students, the words of, late, uh, of the late professor Gordon Spikeman, you know, nothing matters but, you know, um, um, you know, the, the, nothing matters but the kingdom, and, uh, and, and, uh, and because of the kingdom, everything matters is a, is a phrase that he was fond of saying, and, uh, and that includes technology. This is a, a quick, brief outline of the chapters in the book. You'll see that there's a, quite a number of topics that we cover along the way. Uh, we all wrote chapter one together, and then Steve and Ethan and I took lead on, on various other chapters. Um, you can see the chapter 10, Letters to a Young Engineer, at the end, and then we have um, a set of reflection questions as well that students and, and uh, faculty can use. And we hope this book will be helpful, and we, we know it's, um, it's another contribution. We know it won't be the last word uh, in, in this subject, but we hope that it sparks further research and writing and publications in this culturally significant area uh, for the purpose of being faithful and also being obedient. I'd like to invite Steve uh, Vanderlees to come up now and uh, to share a few words um, as well. Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see a number of people that I know from faculty and guests that have come along. Uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, celebrating with us the launch of this book. Um, I wanted to mention it was uh, kind of interesting when we were doing the contracting with uh, InterVarsity Press, our publisher. I didn't realize this, but apparently it's quite normal. They said, we get to choose the book cover. I thought, oh, okay. And we get to choose the title. And I'm like, what? Don't we get to choose the title of our own book? Fortunately, they, they liked the title we proposed. They tweaked it a little bit, and we got to at least provide our input for the cover of the book. Uh, but I, that was something interesting that I learned along the way. Um, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my history of getting to the point of writing this book, and it overlaps uh, significantly with the other folks, and it was hard to pick a short list of just some of the dates along the way uh, of, of how I got here. I tried to point out some of the people that I felt were, were really mentors in my life. Um, when I was a student in engineering here, I had the privilege of having uh, Dr. Jim Bosher as one of my professors, and he, uh, along with Lambert Van Poulen, were two of the key people uh, teaching engineering here at that time. Uh, Lambert Van Poulen was one of the authors on that book, Responsible Technology, that's been mentioned already. Uh, Jim Bosher uh, had his hands in so many different things. He uh, was really the, the founder of recycling in Grand Rapids. He was one of the founders of Camp Tall Turf. Uh, he just put his faith into action in so many ways, and it was present in his classroom as well. So he was really an uh, inspiration for me. Uh, then while I was here as a student, Responsible Technology came out. It was published and I studied it in class and it was deep. It had a lot of really important concepts uh, that uh, really formed me from then on. I started teaching here then and spent over 25 years teaching and, and one of the key things for me was if you're here at an institution like Kelvin, shouldn't you primarily be interested in how your faith informs your discipline. Isn't that why you're here? You could go other places to learn engineering. You could go other places to learn about Christian faith. But to put it together, there's only a few places you can go, Calvin being one of them, Dort being another one. Uh, and so for me, my teaching was not just about the, the technology, the techniques, the uh, science behind engineering, but how should a Christian approach it? And I found some of those principles in responsible technology. My area was computer engineering, and when they wrote Responsible Technology, the internet was just beginning. The web had not even been thought of yet, and so a lot of the technologies that I work with day in, day out, were, were really not thought of yet then. So the principles endure, and you can apply them, but the, the book certainly was becoming stale. 
In 92, Jim Bosher was already in retirement, uh, but was still active and said, we need to pull engineers together that are interested in this, this idea of how does your faith influence your discipline of engineering. So uh, we, along with one other faculty member, uh, organized the first Christian engineering conference that was held here on Calvin's campus uh, in 1992. Uh, Bosher retired, but I continued to keep that conference going and making sure it, or, it organized and gather more people that were behind making it work. Uh, Professor Ermer was, was rather bashful about noting her own involvement for many years. She's also been involved to help establish the society and keep the uh, conference going year after year. When we started, a lot of faculty at other institutions didn't get it. They thought that being a Christian and teaching engineering meant you taught the technology in classroom and then you went with your student to chapel. And the two never met. They, didn't know, they did not overlap. As they heard from some of the faculty coming from Calvin, one of the delightful things for me was to start hearing papers coming from other institutions that were reflecting that idea that, that faith and biblical principles actually change what you do in engineering. It changes the questions you ask. It changes the solutions you consider. Uh, and so it was uh, wonderful to see over, over the years that that idea started taking root in, in other faith traditions outside of the Reformed tradition. Uh, this, conference being held this summer is the 14th of those conferences. They go every, every other year. Uh, I wanted to mention as a faculty member, and Randy Brower is here too, or Joe, Randy and I, uh, uh, as fairly new faculty, got pulled into this project. The, uh, the Christian Reformed Church, that uh, 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 the, the denomination, has a gathering every year called a synod. Uh, to make important decisions for the denomination. And they needed a way to gather votes quickly and they asked, could we develop a voting system? And you know, today you think, well, why didn't they just do an app on, on their phone? Well, this was 98, you couldn't do something like that. So we developed a voting system uh, for the synod. And I thought, okay, is that putting my faith in action? That, that is a way to do it, developing technology for a church. That's one way to think about it. Then in 99, this was my first chance to actually publish on the, the idea, and I tied it to some of my classroom teaching. So I wrote a paper on using science fiction to teach engineering and do it from a Christian perspective. So I put a couple of my interests together just to start putting those ideas on paper. Uh, in 2002, uh, Gail, I think it was actually a little bit earlier that I started talking with Charlie Adams about this idea of a book. And then, I think you're right, there was a, a summer that, that the three of us met and so forth. And yeah, in 2008, there was just this tragedy that he and his wife were in a horrible ca car accident uh, that uh, left him really a shell for, for many years afterwards. So that project was, was really just cut short. Uh, I'm so grateful that Derek and Ethan carried it on. When early on we were talking about this book, I remember Charlie telling me about a new faculty member that he had recruited at Door, Ethan Brew, and he had, he had great promise. So to me, getting a little choked up here even, it was so amazing that Charlie couldn't finish it, but his protege stepped forward and was one of the authors on the book with us. And to me, that is an amazing passing on of faith and um, uh, mentorship that is present in the book there. Sorry, I, uh, it's, uh, really um, hits my heart to think about that. Um, I wanted to mention also that um, for those of you that are in technical disciplines, computer science engineering, um, you have skills that are so important in so many different areas uh, that uh, I want to encourage you to think about service. And I, so I listed there that I served as a school board president. Um, and I think that my background actually was very helpful in um, organizing and thinking about how to tackle important issues for a school board. So that might not be something you think that an engineer could do, but uh, uh, I, I think I served well and was a fit the time that they, they had the need uh, during those years. So I, I wanted to throw that in there as uh, your background actually gives you some interesting skills that might fit in ways you don't, don't realize at first. Um, I have an entrepreneurial side and uh, when uh, the iPhone came out, I saw it as an opportunity to uh, 
to teach a class here at Calvin, an interim class on developing apps and starting a business. And I thought, well, I can't teach about starting a business unless I've actually done it. So I went and created a business uh, with a partner and then we taught, I, I taught the class here and we offered top student in the class could join the business. He's still part of that business today. It's just kind of a weekend warrior kind of thing. We have this side company that we, we develop apps for, but it was a way to, to put uh, some of our ideas into action. Uh, the conference uh, started that I, I mentioned earlier as the Christian Engineering Education Conference, primarily targeted at educators at Christian universities teaching education. But by 2013, we realized we were drawing a lot larger audience. Engineers in industry wanted to think more about how their faith impacted their work. So we, we dropped the education part, still a large part of the conference, but we also wanted to speak more broadly to engineers working in industry, working in technology uh, that were trying to put their faith into action. Uh, by 2015, that was when we started this conversation about what that book would look like and, and start outlining it. Uh, so it's been a number of years in coming. Um, 2016 was when the Engineering Con uh, Society finally formalized. We had been meeting, you can see, since 92. And people had asked me even then, shouldn't we form a society? And I had actually been resistant. I said, we don't have enough momentum. There's not enough people involved. Uh, but about 2015, I sent an email out to a few people. I think Gail was on the list and a few others saying, I think it might be time. Can we pray and think about it? And so we formed the society uh, in 2016 as a uh, organized, incorporated nonprofit in the United States. Uh, another thing that you might not think you could serve on as an engineer is I got to go back to Synod, this time as a delegate. I was serving as an elder in my church, uh, and uh, I got uh, delegated to go uh, be one of the representatives to our classes, and at that classes I got voted to be the elder delegate to Synod. So um, that was, to me, one of the proudest moments of my life to go represent my church, my classes at Synod. So um, they weren't using those voting systems anymore, but I got to, to engage the conversation and, and, I, and, and participated uh, given you know, just my background and skill set. I, I uh, felt like I was meant to be there that year. Uh, I wanted to mention um, one of the other ways that you can put your faith into action that, that is modeled here at Calvin is just simply being very good at your discipline. And so this, this 2021 paper that I wrote with a um, colleague that I met through my work, uh, who is an engineer at Boeing, we wrote a paper on an important topic. And it turned out that others thought it was important and it, it won this best of conference award. And I wanted to point this one out because it doesn't start by saying, by the way, Steve is a Christian. It is on a technical topic, but it is, carefully done, and when people go and look at who wrote this, it becomes quickly obvious to them by what else I wrote, by what they can find on social media, that I am coming from a Christian faith perspective. And I think that's one way that we witness is to do very good work in our field, and then when people realize that we're Christians, they say, oh, that's an interesting connection there, I wanna know more. And so that provides one way to do that, uh, to put your faith into action, it's just simply doing that work well. Our book talks about many other ways to do that, including thinking through how to be explicitly Christian in the ways that you do technology. And I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Uh, so 2022, the bottom of the list, uh, we finally got to this uh, publication. We were actually pretty much done with the book last summer, I think, right? And it took this long to finally get it through copy edit, finalize everything, and, and get the book out there. Um, all right. so. Um, We've been dancing around the book a little bit. Uh, Derek showed you sort of the table of contents. Of course, we don't want to tell you too much. We want you to go buy it. But uh, let me give you a couple teasers. There's a number of themes that we touch on in the book. Uh, the first one I wanted to mention was uh, um, loving God, right? That's the first and greatest commandment. If you are working in technology or working in the sciences, um, uh, you probably have seen, if you took a basic physics class, that uh, set of equations on the right. Um, I chose what I think is sort of the most elegant uh, uh, differential version uh, of, of Maxwell's equations because I, if you walk through and understand what those mean, so I took them as part of a physics class first here at Calvin. If you're in electrical engineering, you, you've probably seen these. Um, and they describe electromagnetics in a very elegant way. And they look, 
may be simple, there's not a lot of symbols there, but I found out in that physics class, this is hard stuff to actually apply them, is, is incredibly complicated. And maybe I was naive coming through high school and going into to college, but I didn't realize light was an electromagnetic phenomenon until I got to that class, and I'm like, this describes electricity and mag magnetism and light? That's just amazing. So to me, this connects me to our creator that Maxwell's equations in part are so elegant and so on the surface simple because they reflect an incredibly complicated and yet in some ways very straightforward creator who said let there be light. And it wasn't just the light that we're seeing here but it has this incredible predictable behavior behind it. And so there's a beauty there just in Maxwell's equations that I see and you find your beauty in, in you know, your own area. You, you might see it in the, the, the biology of creation. You might see it in other areas in the beauty of music or whatever it might be. But all of those spring forth from a creator who is incredibly beautiful. And as an engineer, I get to appreciate part of that and that helps me to worship and love God. As an engineer, I also have a particular ability to pursue that second great commandment of loving my neighbor. Uh, not only can I recognize in creation these incredibly interesting facets, but I can think about how might I use that in ways that love my neighbor and designing technology to help them. Um, you probably can't see it from where you're sitting. I'm wearing hearing aids. I have hearing loss. It's, it's part of the fall, you might say. And one of the technological creations that help redeem my hearing are these hearing aids. They're not perfect. My hearing is not perfect, but these make it workable for me. And so that's a wonderful way that someone has created a tiny device, electronic device, that is loving me as a neighbor to help me with my hearing. Each of you has technologies that you lean on, that you use every day, that are loving you through that technology. That's a way that we put that principle into practice. How are we able to do that? Um, well, it's this partly, I think, it's because we're created in God's image. It's the Imago Dei. Uh, the, the engineering is a creative discipline, so it not only uses science and math, but it uses art and it uses creativity. I think that's directly part of our reflecting the creator. We can't create out of nothing, but we certainly can take the resources of creation and combine them in ways that no one has thought of before to produce a new technology, a new product. And if we're doing it from Christian principles, we're doing it because we want to love our neighbor, not simply to make a profit, although making a profit to keep a business going is also a way to love neighbor by creating good employment, but by creating a product that then helps multiple people. Uh, I recall having engineering students that wanted to go work on mission projects, uh, maybe in some faraway country that needed uh, uh, drinking water. And, uh, I thought that was noble that they would do, you know, donate the physical labor to, for exa example, create a well in that village. I almost always encourage them to think about, can you create new well technology so instead of helping one, one village, you help 5,000 villages? Think about how do you put your engineering knowledge to work at the same time in that mission field? Uh, so that was something I, I often tried to encourage students to think about, is that that you have skills that you can carry out mission in, in ways that maybe others can't. Some of the principles that you might find in the Bible might not strike you right away as applying to engineering, but I just wanted to mention three of them. These and many others show up in our book. Uh, one that's been very important to me is justice. Uh, and that is the idea of creating fairness for people, uh, of not segregating people. And engineering can create injustice. There's a, an important example in our book of, a, of, of where an, an engineer um, somewhat intentionally created an injustice, and in this case it was a racial injustice. But you could think of injustice between genders, between races. Uh, there's a lot of ways that injustice can occur. You can also think of technologies that create justice. For example, creating clean drinking water. If, if that is something you think that is a basic human need, then working on ways to provide clean drinking water is a way to create justice, to enhance justice in a community. Uh, another important principle that comes uh, r really out of even early Genesis is the idea that we as humans are, are appointed as stewards of creation. Uh, so, um, here you might hear some Christians saying the best thing we can do as humans is to just 
step away from creation and let it be, because we just mess it up. And we do have a lot of examples of people messing up creation, where we've created environmental hardship, we've created pollution, we've messed up the creation. But we are actually called to do more than just simply observe it. We are called to steward it and called to cultivate it. So engineers, when we do it right, can be pursuing a calling of steward, of cultivating the creation, of finding new ways to put together resources that respect the creation, respect the environment, and care for our neighbors. So stewardship, I see, is really a broad call for those of us working in technology. And then humility, I think, is also important. Um, our confidence needs to be in God, not in ourselves, not in our technology. And being an engineer, you can easily slip into pride because you make something that works and you see people using it and you can start putting your confidence in the technology. And it's funny, we shouldn't do that because we all have experienced computers that crash, uh, tech, uh, cars that run out when they shunt and they stop working. Uh, we, we know that you can't trust technology, but somehow it's very easy to start depending on it. And it's very easy to start depending on yourself as I can do this. Uh, so humility, I think, is very important for us individually uh, as people, but also some humility in the technology to, to recognize it, there's gonna be issues there. I work in avionics, the uh, computers that fly the aircraft. Part of my job is to say never to trust any of it, that you don't trust the software, you don't trust the computer. The computer might go down, there, might be, there better be a second one, there better be a backup plan. Don't trust the person that wrote the software, somebody else has to review it. So there's, there's this, uh, attitude that's important of, of, I'd say, humility, that you assume things might go wrong and you do your best to find those, and you build into the technology ways to address the fact that it could go wrong. Because, and in many technologies, certainly in aircraft, people's lives depend on it. It's very important to get that right and the chances of something going wrong to be very, very small. And that's just three principles as teasers. There's several others that we hope you'll look through in the, in the book. I mentioned a little bit engineering as mission. I wanted to come back to that because not only could an engineer go on to the mission field as you might traditionally hear about it in your churches where a group or an individual goes off to a faraway place to serve in that area. Um, there's another mission field that very few people can get into unless you have the right credentials and it's technical corporate America. You cannot walk into IBM or Google and witness off the street. And there are a lot of people there that are suspicious of Christians, that have heard the wrong things, that think Christians are hypocritical. And the only way that you will witness to them is if you work there as a computer scientist or an engineer, and you do your job well, and you show that Christians can be good scientists, can be good engineers. And suddenly you have an opportunity to witness to a group that otherwise will not hear what real Christianity looks like. So there's a whole mission field that's not across the ocean, it's across the street for you. And those of you working in technical areas have the ability to be a good engineer, be a good technical uh, 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 career, uh, have a good technical career, and show what it's like to pursue that from a Christian perspective. So uh, the mission field is pretty broad for you. And then maybe to come back and wrap it up to that book, Responsible Technology, uh, the, being a Christian in, in engineering is not just about having the right behaviors, about telling the truth, about being humble, but the book poses this question and thinks about some ways to answer it that we hope you will continue thinking about. How do I change what I do in my actual design because of my Christian faith principles? Any real complex design problem is going to have more than one possible answer. And how do you choose among those different alternatives which ones are the best? If you didn't have a faith perspective, you might have a short list. I'm gonna choose one that's lower cost, that's more reliable, that's gonna be more marketable, uh, maybe that I can get to market more quickly. Those are some of the drivers that will help you choose between those alternatives. For a Christian, your list is a little bit bigger. Which ones honor stewardship? Which ones will produce more justice for the community? Which ones recognize humility? Those principles also come into play. And I'll tell you, people from other faith traditions are not going to argue with justice or stewardship. That makes sense to them. So that we are not unique in thinking justice is important. So you often will have a hearing, surprisingly, with people that are otherwise possibly hostile to Christianity. 
Uh, but when you think about how, what is the best way to do this design, uh, those principles can come out and people understand where you're coming from in your faith. Um, we have a closing slide here of just some acknowledgments. You've heard some of these. That list of names at the end are people that helped with reviewing the book that uh, uh, we wanted to recognize. Some of these are some former students that were here at Calvin and, and have gone off into industry. Uh, and there's a couple uh, faculty members that are here now as well. So we're, we appreciate uh, that feedback. Um, to wrap up, I think uh, Professor Wonder is going to uh, cover a Q&A session to see if there's any questions and answers. And thank you so much for being here. So I'll assume that applause was for both Derek and Steve, and I won't ask you to applause again for the first part of the presentation. I'm David Wonder. I'm Dean for Faculty Development and Research Initiatives at Calvin. I'm also, as Steve uh, said, a professor of engineering. Uh, it's not often that I get to wear both of those hats, and so I'm very pleased and honored to be here as both professor and dean. Um, part of my role uh, as dean is to provide support for the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship, and you'll see that they're listed in the, the acknowledgments. If you, um, if you remember, they were also highlighted uh, with the Responsible Technology publication uh, decades ago, now decades ago. So a great legacy and a continuing legacy of supporting intentional, wise uh, Christian scholarship. And I'd like to acknowledge Susan Felch, who's um, in the audience, who's our most immediate former director of the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship, and who was um, formative in um, providing support for this project. Susan. <clears throat> I, actually, I actually brought a poem by Rudyard Kipling of uh, Jungle Book fame. Uh, I will not read it for the sake of time, and I, my better judgment says it's probably not the right time or place to read it. It's uh, titled The Sons of Martha, and it's a celebration of engineers, uh, the sons of Martha, uh, allowing the sons of Mary to live the good life. Uh, so if that whets your appetite, um, I encourage you to find it. I'll, I'll find it for you if you're interested. So um, my, my, my role here um, for this presentation is to moderate questions. And so I will take questions um, as I see them raised. And I, what, what I'll uh, attempt to do is repeat them so everybody can hear them. And then uh, let Steve or Derek uh, offer a response. Um, I love this recital hall. Uh, the basket weave wood on the side. Um, you can thank an architect and an acoustic engineer. I think we could do this without a microphone. This has just been a beautiful um, celebration of a book, a uh, comprehensive, accessible book, um, and um, a celebration of history and connections and relationships and really careful and thoughtful scholarship. I'm gonna ask the first question. And uh, I, was, I was mulling this over and it was cemented uh, when you read the letter, Derek. What's your response? We've got a number of students uh, and practitioners in the room. Can you provide a, a relatively brief response to, to how, you'd, how you'd answer a question like that. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I, I think you have to also put the letter in context of a, of a young engineer who's experiencing some of the disappointments and the adjustments of switching from school to industry. But I think Steve has answered a few of those questions already in his last part of his slide, you know, thinking about your work is a legitimate area of kingdom service. I think a lot of engineers often think about, um, there, there's often this attitude in, in larger evangelical circles that in order to really serve the Lord, you have to become a missionary. And if you can't be a missionary, you become a pastor. And if you can't do that, then you get a job to support missionaries and pastors. Um, th there's sometimes this, this dualistic attitude uh, where we see kingdom work uh, is very dualistically, you know, there's they're sort of like, you know, church and missions and so on, and then there's sort of like everyday life. And I think what's really, really wonderful about um, a broad Reformed Christian perspective is that all of life matters. The, the quote I was trying to, to say earlier was the, the Gordon Spikeman quote, that nothing matters but the kingdom, but because of the kingdom, everything matters, and we can live a life of obedience and witness in, in the area of engineering as well. And, and one of the efforts in this book was to provide a practical field guide. So, you know, it's nice to have these, these, uh, these large lofty ideas about every square inch, 
but then how then shall we engineer is the question. How then shall we engineer? And so, uh, so we hope that this book will be a helpful encouragement. And yes, there's a bunch of letters that go back and forth in that final chapter, and so I'll encourage you to read, read those on your own. Thanks. Questions? Surely. This goes way back uh, in the history of Western reading. And I'm not a Western reader, Western, but I was talking to you. Um, you have your sermon list here, working on the book that was first referenced on the software technology. You made an important distinction in terms of how did the kingdom of God arrive? And So, so the question, in case you didn't hear, is um, how, do we, how do we wrestle with, how do we navigate, how do we embrace uh, being kingdom citizens as engineers? And how do we, how do we um, I'm rephrasing it a little bit, um, but I think they heard the original question. So I just wanted everybody to, to get the gist of the question. Yeah, so one of our chapters is technology and the future. Right, this idea of technological progress ushering in the new heavens and the new earth, and, and we, we basically say that's wrong-headed. Um, and I, I like the way you put it, and uh, I think Egbert's been really you know, um, spot on in his writings along those lines, that we don't usher in the new heavens and the new earth. We get to participate. I think 2 Corinthians 5 talks about us being agents of reconciliation. But it's Colossians 1, it's Christ through his blood who's reconciling all things, right? The, the new heavens and the new earth are, are, are built um, not by human hands. Um, so I, I think we get to, I like the quote by Lewis Smedes we include, you know, we're called to make some imperfect models of the perfect world to come, right? We, we get to kind of practice that, to be new creation signposts. But it's not gonna be us. Um, our chapter on technology in the future talks about transhumanism, about technicism, We've got some Star Trek references. You know, we, we, we basically look at sort of this, this enlightenment idea that we will usher in the new heavens and the new earth on our own wits, you know, a kind of post-millennial uh, view, right? A kind of eschatology without God and, 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 and provide a biblical corrective for that while yet seeing the value of our work. You know, I, I, I like um, also the, the writings of Richard Mao on that, you know, the, the uh, uh, when the kings come marching in, that, you know, that all of our technological artifacts will be purified and changed and, 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 uh, and uh, made sin free, but we'll have technology in the new heavens and the new earth, but technology that's, that's free of sin, of course. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. I'll, I'll just add one side note to that. Um, I think often Christians get uh, maybe too focused on just one of the commissions we have. And uh, I think sometimes, and Calvin does this well, thinks back to we have a commission already in Genesis uh, and sometimes called the cultural mandate of, of uh, as being stewards of creation, of developing that creation. So I mentioned this a little earlier, and I think that both of those are important, building the kingdom, witnessing, going to the ends of the earth. But we are also, I think, uh, called to enjoy the creation and, and participate in it. Uh, and so that original Genesis mandate still holds. It was not supplanted, but is, is addition. Uh, we've got lots of work to do and lots of things to enjoy in the creation. And I, I agree with, like Derek said, uh, it is not our, uh, our primary responsibility. We get to participate in it. Uh, so uh, in many ways, I, I've I think engineering is a one way, but a wonderful way to experience those different aspects of Christianity and to be called into something where what you do matters uh, immediately, matters to your neighbor, and, and is a way that uh, we are um, 
enjoying God in the end. So, and I think that's the, what the first question of the Westminster Catechism, what's our primary job, is to be, enjoy God, and we can do that through, as an engineer, the work that we're doing. Questions? So uh, the question is uh, specifically for Steve and whether he'd comment on the Boeing 737 MAX disaster. Yeah, so that, uh, if you've been following the press on that, I will say it, it has been distressing to me to see what happened there. The, um, the way the system is supposed to work is that there is a complete set of interlocks so that things are double and triple checked all along the way. What so far has been reported is that there, there are multiple failures in the system that allowed a design change to be uh, put into the field that was not completely understood. Um, it turned out that there was a situation where the engines could overcompensate and the pilots would, would react improperly if they weren't trained appropriately or had the, didn't have the right signals. And so that coming together should have gotten extra scrutiny and it did not. And so there were multiple failures. So in my opinion, the FAA fell down on the job and the people at Boeing fell down on the job for not making sure that that happened. And lives were lost because of it. The, the track record for the aerospace industry is incredibly good. And so uh, it's, uh, this is really the exception to the rule, but it's a little scary that that could happen to me. And so I think appropriately it's gotten a lot more attention uh, to the highest levels to say, let's make sure that never happens again. Um, I'll just quickly mention uh, the, the FAA has a mandate to protect the flying public, but also to advocate for flying. And that's a contradiction. And so it, it causes a tension within the FAA. Also, it tends to be underfunded, so it must depend on the applicants themselves to do some of that groundwork. And to me, that's again, a tension that shouldn't be there. Uh, so uh, there are, <laughs> we could talk for an hour on other things, but uh, just it, the, the humility was not followed there to recognize that things could go wrong and you need to spend the time to think through and have multiple perspectives to ensure that it doesn't get through to the aircraft. And yeah, thanks for the question. The question is, what is what's uh, one thing that each author had to wrestle with as they developed and completed this book? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think um, if you look at uh, that chapter that I read or the letter from the young engineer, um, I think it was a reminder uh, for me. I, I, I had some experiences in industry that made me a little jaded about things. And, and I think um, um, writing that sequence of letters was a therapeutic exercise for me in some ways, but um, um, also kind of understanding you know, the tension between the sort of delight of technology, that uh, early kind of experience I had playing in my basement with ham radios and uh, and, and sort of the, the, the thorns and thistles that we have to wrestle with um, and, and, and how, to, how to think about that. I think the other thing too is uh, how to find the most winsome and helpful way for my students to understand uh, one topic that we wrestle with every year. I teach the capstone course in computer science um, here at Calvin. Is, uh, is the idea that technology is value laden, that, it, that it's not neutral, that it has a bias. Um, and finding new and fresh uh, ways to, to kind of communicate that to a new generation of students. I think if you begin with the, with the kind of assertion that technology is neutral, then your responsibility uh, is, is sort of abdicated, right? It's just, just a neutral tool, it's up to the user, 
Um, and so finding, and, and Steve contributed a chapter on that particular topic, like thinking about the ways in which technology is not neutral. And, and in fact, it relates to the notion that all of life is religious, right? We live quorum Deo before the face of God and everything we do is, uh, is you know, in obedience to God's call and for his, his will for his creation or acts of more disobedience. So I, um, I, I found it really, really interesting to kind of wrestle to come up with fresh and winsome and convincing um, uh, ways to communicate that to a new generation of students. I had some of the same uh, extra thinking as Derek, but I'll, I'll mention another area that um, I think is common for engineers. You all think you do it the right way, and then you, you have peer review and you find out somebody thinks differently. And so that showed up in a number of ways in the book. The three authors were iron sharpening iron. So, you know, I thought I had just the perfect word, and Derek said, that doesn't make sense, Steve. And you know, that, so you, we, we had that back and forth that I think made for a better book. Uh, so, and then we had a lot of reviewers that came back, and a couple of them were, harsh <laughs> and so we had to rethink are we getting the point across so and again it made for a better book but that is how engineering goes the best product are the ones developed by a team with different perspectives that sharpen each other and say have you thought of it from this point of view have you thought of it from the point of view of someone taller than you shorter than you does the product still work for them and occasionally you get surprised and you have to put your pride away and say you know they're right I need to fix this so I you know, I knew that already. Going to the book, I learned it again. <laughs> so we have time, I think, for one more question. Uh, fortunately, there will be a reception immediately following uh, this session, just out in the lobby, uh, with cake and punch, and the authors will be available for follow-on questions. Yeah, so you get the last question. I'm going to assume that folks heard the question rather than repeat it. Uh, so I'll just hand it off to Derek, I guess, first. Just really quickly, uh, thanks for that question. Fred Brooks, by the way, um, uh, I've met him, I think, twice. Uh, and, and he has a wonderful quote in his ACM Turing Awards speech, which is like the Nobel Prize for computer science, where he says that we, you know, if, we're if our creations are going to be true, noble, and good, we have to attend to our hearts, you know. It's almost like he's speaking um, from Jamie Smith's books, you know, this idea that the heart is important in terms of, you know, Proverbs 4, verse 23, you know, we need to attend to our hearts. Everything we do flows from it. But your question about the, the David Brooks moment, uh, when I started my PhD, I worked in computer vision. So this was 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of the cool applications, cool in quotes, um, and highly publishable applications were applications for doing facial recognition, uh, profiling, and, and other things. Um, and uh, I felt very uncomfortable with writing a thesis that would you know, be used in those kinds of applications. And, uh, and I wrestled with that for quite a while. I ended up using computer vision for motion control um, and automation. And later on, when I started working at Redeemer, I got some funding to do some research. And I, I sought out ways, um, re redeeming applications for how some of this technology could be used. And one of the things we, we published several papers on was uh, computer vision for sorting of recyclable goods. So we actually went to the local recycling plant, and this is kind of echoing a bit of Jim Bosher's work, uh, which is well known in this, in this city. Um, this was back in Canada, but we noticed that there were some people still hand sorting certain goods, polycoat con containers, there was no way to automate the sorting of those, uh, and other things that were tremendous challenges. Um, 
And, and people were still manually sorting things on a fast moving conveyor belt, you know, work that's dull, dangerous, and dirty. And, uh, and so we, we spent a bunch of time trying to use these computer vision algorithms to automate the sorting of recyclable goods uh, using some uh, support vector machines, machine learning. Uh, but it seemed to me that that was, you know, a way of responding to the, the cultural mandate to try and take better care of the earth and using technology in ways that, uh, that could be considered redeeming. It, it, it also strikes me that, you know, this, this echoes the thing I learned from Al Walters in Creation Regain, the notion of structure and direction, right? Technology has this creational structure, right? These possibilities latent in creation and the, and the, the area where we need to look at is how are we directing it? How are we using it? How are we, how are we unfolding it? And, uh, and I always think about that structure and direction question when I'm, when I'm working on tech and I found that a, a helpful guide. I haven't had so much maybe the Stark Fred Books moment, but I have had places where um, something I developed got used in a way I did not expect, and sometimes it was being used beyond what, what it was designed for, and that sometimes was concerning for me to say it wasn't meant for that purpose. And it wasn't necessarily one that I cringed at, but more of the cringe was I, I didn't have time to make sure it would work in that environment. And so it was a matter of did, was there due diligence. So I've certainly had that happen. I've also seen, and the book mentions a couple of these, there's sometimes some serendipitous moments where the designer doesn't realize a use for that technology. That's a very good thing. Uh, so there's certainly lots of examples of unanticipated consequences where technology was abused or used in a way that wasn't intended. But once in a while, the end user, who's also creative, figures out a way to use the technology in a wonderfully new way. And so I, I would love to leave room for that, the, the opposite of that Fred Brooks moment, to say, Here, here's a place where I didn't think it would go, that it actually is doing some good. And so those can be uh, wonderful. And we've got a couple examples kind of in each direction in the book. So it's one last teaser. Uh, so is it time for cake? <laughs> <laughs> So let's, uh, let's, let's thank our presenters once again. Okay, let's enjoy uh, some time of fellowship and gathering just outside the doors and in the lobby. Thank you.